here at one of my favorite places. This is Spring Farm Greenhouse. Since we're studying plants this week, I thought I would bring you up here. My friend Kent is going to take us on a tour, show us some of the different plants that are grown here and the ways they take care of them. Let's go ahead in now to meet Kent. This is Kenton, our plant expert. He's about to take us on a tour as we enter the greenhouse here. Thank you, Rachel. Yes, this way, everybody. Okay, so it's kind of interesting how the garden center is laid out in multiple different options. We have um, house plants, which is directly behind me. If you look up here, we got our annuals, bedding plants, and so forth. Um, the first main caption here is everything about plants that you plant outside that are going to die off before winter. It's in, and so forth. We got nursery stock, we got perennials and so forth in the back. And I'll take you around and I'll show you the shade plants and then we'll step outside. Okay, so we're in our shade section here. All these plants will take shade like on your porch, not on a patio where you're dealing with the sunlight. We've got furnaces in here for the winter time. We've got the hoops that you're seeing in the greenhouse facility. It builds a lot of its heat throughout the summer so we don't have to do any heating in here. Um, some of my favorite plants are in the shade categories where we're dealing with begonias and sunning patients. It's directly behind me. This is one of my very best plants. And you can see this particular plant can take everything you can give it. It can take full sun, full shade, doesn't matter. It can take all the heat, humidity, and so forth. It's one of my very best plants. Okay, so all plants kind of have to have their own nutrients, kind of like you'd use to decorate your own table with. Um, we treat our plants with a, um, a drip irrigation and we'll put these into the hang basket when we hang it up and through that drip we'll give it fertilizer, all its pH, all its alkaline that it needs to take the plants from a small start all the way up to the finished product that you guys would see in the springtime. So these plants are getting three to four hundred parts per million in fertilizer and we do that as a continuous feed. And equivalent to that, if you guys would have it at home, you would do it one shot time per week. You can mix it in a watering can and do that once a week. And that would be equivalent to what we do every day here at the Garden Center. Okay, so this is my favorite area of the Garden Center. This is all succulents, it's all cactus and so forth. These plants here um, tend to grow on the water that we give them. Um, the plant will absorb the water through its leaf versus regular plants, which absorbs it in its roots. Um, a succulent, what makes a succulent and a cacti so hardy is that um, the water gets absorbed in the leaf and um, it contains it there. So when the succulent starts losing its size, it's because it's running out of water. It's not like it necessarily wilts and dies like your regular petal or blossom blooms. We have a lot of cactuses over in here, which are some of our favorites, they have a lot of prickles, a lot of needles and so forth to them. Just want to be careful when you're dealing with these plants, but they're a lot of fun. Okay, so this is our sun section. Everything in here is full sun. You can take these plants and put them in your flower beds. You can find them in containers and pots. Doesn't matter. Um, the plants that we're seeing here um, bloom all season long throughout the summer. You notice that a lot with the calabacoas, which um, are more like your small petunias. Instead of having those large blooms that spread out throughout the whole season, these stay this keep the small, tiny blooms about the size of a quarter. section house so everything in here is going to be a one-time season that you can plant but it dies off with the first frost in the fall I'm going to take you outside I'm going to show you some of our vegetables and our perennial plants and uh, so if you guys are into edible gardening and so forth you can step right outside okay so outside here we keep our vegetable plants and these are our 
cold crops, which are the plants that can take, you can plant those earlier in the season, they can take the cooler temperatures, like your lettuces, broccoli, cabbage, and so forth. If you take these plants and you plant them in the midsummer, they won't do as good for you because of the high heat levels that you'll be dealing with. That's why you plant them early in the spring. So what do we have out here? Got Onions, onion, lettuce. Lettuce, and cold crops, which would be your broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and so forth. Do these get flowers on them? No flowers. These are all your edible, edible vegetables. This is our cool house. Everything in here we grow at a temperature of about 40 to 60 degrees versus the last house we were in, which is stage one, that we grow at 60 to 80 degrees. So everything in here can grow at a lot cooler temperatures and it keeps the size more compact. Um, like your vegetable plants, which should be your tomatoes, peppers, Right here we're looking at our melons and squashes and so forth. These we can hold in a pool house versus in a, in a hot house where they grow leaps and downs. <clears throat> we also grow our spring flowers in here, which would be our pansies and our tulips, daffodils and so forth. But on stage two, we put in our vegetable plants and some of our waved petunias and so forth, which would be a lot cooler. So in a garden center, the tag is one of the most um, informational items that you can get as far as um, when you're working with plants, vegetables, or whatever. Um, we do a lot of the proven winners, which prizes itself a lot on its own tag. Um, you'll see the height and the size of it, if it can take full sun or part sun in the front of the tag. And then on the flip side, if you flip it right around the back, you'll see your height, your bloom, the habit, spacing, zones, and fertilizers, and what you need to do for the plant to see if it's gonna work for the areas that you're working with. We do a lot of proven winners, and we really enjoy them because they have a really good plant that's bred to last out in the garden, containers, and so forth. So if you were looking at this one, uh, it needs full sun or part sun, and it's going to be six to 12 inches high. Correct. And it Absolutely. is called a super tunia. Mm -hmm. Okay, so tomato plants are our best sellers. Everybody loves tomatoes, and that's what we do here. So um, beef steak is one of our most popular varieties. And again, just talking about the tag in the last section there, um, beef, the burpee has one of the largest tags in the vegetable industry that you can get as far as information on vegetables and so forth. If you have any um, logistics, if you can grow this in your place, you can always go online at burpee.com and they'll help you a lot with information and so forth. Um, <clears throat> beef steak, bush steak, and so forth is one of our favorites. And again, on the back side, in the four pack tomatoes, Burpee has a lot of information on the back of their tags. So this one specifically says, if we turn it around, it says that it will take six, is that 65 days to harvest? Correct. And so then they, go ahead. So from the time that you we seed this plant, which you're buying at this stage would be about two weeks old, um, 65 days after the day we seed it, you're looking at harvest. So this particular plant will be I'll probably be ready for harvest in August, which would be your tomatoes that you can use for canning, fresh eating, and so forth. Um, cherry tomatoes and smaller tomatoes often have a lot shorter term, and they can give you more fresh eating varieties and so forth. So how long have these been? These are about two to three weeks old. Okay. And then that's two to three weeks old. So it says that they'll get uh, two and a half to three feet high. So they're going to grow a Correct. lot from here Absolutely. to here. And these need full sun. Correct. Six plus hours if you're looking into tag. Right. Now the right side of the tag looks a little different because it's in Spanish. Right. <laughs> there you go. The, um, the tomato plant on average with um, heat at about 60 degrees plus can grow almost six to eight inches a week and that's why a tomato plant is we keep them in our cool house so we can actually contain them versus having them in the, in the warmer section where we wouldn't be able to hold them at all all right so we're outside and it's a lot chillier out here these plants everything you're seeing out here can be planted and it'll come back for you every year um, i'm going to take you inside and um, we'll show you some of our shade perennials and then we'll go out around the back we'll see some trees shrubs and some log right So 
So in here, everything in here is what we call shade perennials. You can plant these on the back side of your house, underneath trees and so forth, where you get a lot of wet grounds, a lot of shade and so forth. We've got some bright plants in here, which should be our hookahs, lemon love. We've got hostas, which gets, can get up to be about four feet high. And some of my favorites, which are up in the end, we've got a lot of ferns. That's one of my very favorite perennial plants that can take shade and so forth. What do you have to do to take care of a perennial plant? The best thing you can do for a perennial is plant it and water. It's about the best thing you can do. Um, make sure if you're dealing with shade that you get a lot of water to the plant because it can, if it does get sunlight, it'll dry it out right away. And it'll burn the foliage and the leaves on it. But if you can keep it wet and um, plant it and so forth, it's the best thing you can do. I always feel the ground to make sure that it's moist, to make sure that it's wet. So I don't have to rewater it if I don't need to. So this is shade fern, and um, it's got a lot of more like the the woodland effect to it versus something that's cultured and clean. But yeah, like I said, keep them wet and plant them, and make sure that they don't dry out. That's the best thing you can do for perennials. You'll notice a lot when sometimes when you plant a perennial that it doesn't come back for you the following year. Um, it's because it dried out the first two three weeks that it was planted in the season. But um, right after planting, you want to make sure that you keep it wet. And um, when we say keep it wet, we mean watering it about 30 seconds, two to three times a week after you're done planting it. Okay, so outside of the shade house, there's a lot more perennials. And that's what you'll be seeing on the outside here. These plants can take full hot pounding sun all day long. It doesn't matter. Most of these plants on the perennials, there's not a whole lot of perennials that start blooming from frost and they bloom the rest of the frost. There's one or two that do that. And that's um, Proboscia denim and lace, which is one of my favorite. It's right down here. I could get a close look at that. But most perennials will have their windows that they bloom and that's last at the highest, which would be about a, about a month from June to Ju June to July, August to September, whatever. They each have their season, so you have color year round. But this particular guy starts blooming in June, which is denim and lace. It starts blooming in June, and it'll bloom pretty much all the way up to when you guys are starting decorating with the fall moms and so forth. I might have to try one of those, Ken. It gets about two and a half feet high. It spreads out to be about two and a half feet across. It's one of my favorites. Oh, I'll have to try that one. There you Never go. heard of it. You gotta. Yeah, that's a, that's a one. new one for me. All right, so where are we heading next? I'll show you one more house, a sun house at Pernod. Smaller quart sizes and so forth. Um, the perennials that are in here need to have a lot more heat to get them growing. So the window on an average perennial will start in about February. This particular plant we got to start in September of the year before we want to sell it. So we'll keep it in a hot house, but once it's down blooming and so forth, it's a pretty good perennial that starts blooming in July and it'll bloom almost to September. This is a fairly long blooming perennial outside of my last guy that I just showed you. Grasses are always a favorite. Anybody does grasses with strawberries and cream, which is a ribbon grass. This particular one just keeps the variegated foliage to it. it. Comes out in the springtime, but it does not get any blooms like a lot of your ornamental grasses and so forth. Kenton, you said variegated. Can you explain that to us? What is that? I can. Um, variegated is a multi-branched um, foliage that you're seeing. Okay. This one's called a striped ribbon grass, which you can kind of see the texture and the mm -hmm. color, color of the foliage. Kind of looks like there's pieces of ribbon running through the, the blade of the it grass as you like follow that. that. I, can, I can show you two different types of variegated um, foliage in a grass if you want to take a look at that. Okay. But um, you can see the, the brightness of this one versus morning light, which should be here. I don't even know why they class this as a variegated grass compared to looking, mm -hmm. once you're looking at strawberry and ribbons. But this one is variegated to an extent, but it's like a, more or less like pinstriping compared to the, the last one that we've seen, which is a lot Bright, brighter. Very fine and thin. For the area that you're working with. Okay. Can, can you tell us about the plants that grow close to the ground that maybe when you're planting, you want to plant in front of everything? 
right i can so jeepers creepers which is our our last step in perennials um, are the ones that stay super low so if you're laying out a landscape you want to have your high accent points you want to have your mid heights which is going to carry most of your coloring for you and then finally you want to have your bottom layer which is your lower plants that stay about six to eight inches off of the ground and some of those spread really well they along do. the ground over the rocks and over my flower bed that i'm holding here mm -hmm. gets about two to three inches high and it just creeps it just spreads it, like everything yes but the jeepers creeper section which is right in here is one of our lowest lying perennials that we have and you use them a lot for banks rock gardens and so forth we like the ice plants which are right down here right it's a fairly long blooming when plant. When the blooms open, they're really pretty. I know right. they're closed right now. Right. It's a fairly long blooming plant. It kind of gets that um, buttercup or that daisy bloom mm -hmm. to it about one to two inches off the top of this guy. It's pretty interesting. <clears throat> but yeah, that's that's one perennial that you can't kill. <laughs> if you're looking for a perennial to grow anywhere, Mine that's is starting, starting to come back. It's getting green. Okay. At my house, yes. Look, we got a rose blooming. We got a rose oh. blooming. That's called Brindabella. It's the first and only rose out there that's going to give you the scent of like a florist rose, but it's still not going to get the powdery mildew like you've seen on a lot of landscape roses and so forth. Okay. So we're really excited about that plant this year. Okay, so this is phase three. This is our nursery, uh, shrubbery, and tree line of the, um, of the garden center that you've seen so far. So everything out here is more of your larger accents that you would be landscaping a house or looking to put some shade trees or whatever, that you'll find pretty much all out here. These plants, um, a lot of your these plants that you're seeing here are your blooming varieties, which will get up to be about four to five feet, depends on your variety. And they'll bloom throughout the season, kind of like the perennials, they'll have their own little sections that they bloom in. Some of my very favorites, which is right behind us, fine line, which is this guy right here. I use it a lot. You can use it real close to a house. It only gets to be about one to two feet across. And it spreads. It spreads up to be about four to five feet high. Kind of gets a fern leaf foliage to it in the summertime when it moves out. And um, like I said, you can get it right up close to a house, and it's not going to overpower what you're working with. You've got a lot of trees and so forth in the back here, like your maple trees, your oaks, your flowering cherries. You're seeing everywhere that are blooming this time of the year. I like your umbrellas. You've got your larger shade trees that you'd be using if you want to create some shade around your house and so forth. So these are the ones that grow in to be like the real big ones. This is the real deal. Gets up to be about 40 foot high, spreads out to be about 45 foot across. So they're, they're pretty big plants. Like the one you're seeing here, a lot of maples don't emerge with the crimson colored foliage that we're working with here. But this plant comes out with the red foliage and it keeps that all summer long. Instead of a lot of the other regular sugar maples and so forth, we're gonna get the colors in the fall. So this is your favorite part of spring farm greenhouses. Yes. We have a lot of we do a lot of these ornamental fish for people with water gardenings and so forth. You'll see your shabunkins, goldfish, koi, and so forth. We get a lot of tadpoles, we get a little snails in, some floating lilies. But a lot of people use these for decorative ponds and sometimes they get them in those small aquariums and so forth. We would love to bring Brady up here when he was little just to see the fish. So one of his favorite parts. Are these sorted by size? Is that how right. they go in? Those, right. Yeah. A lot by variety. Um, the koi, which you're seeing here, there it is off. you might get a little bit of clearer view there. The koi, which you're, which you're seeing here, is the butterfly. And these will get up to be about six to eight inches long. And their fins on them will be about two to three inches, which makes it a, a premium for koi. Um, the tank to your side, which is your standard koi, those, those will get about six to eight inches long and their fins will be about a half inch to an inch. It makes it look a bit more different. These look more like an angel fish or something really graceful compared to the standard. Um, is there a certain temperature of water that they have to be in or can they withstand any temperature? Pretty much anything. Okay, um, great. Koi, if you're looking at koi for an outdoor pond, your water has to be 28 to 30 inches deep. Anything under that, they will not survive because the top first three, four inches of that can freeze. But um, goldfish, comets, and shabunkins, 
This can more or less take anything. You can put in 16 inches of water and they'll be fine. Okay, good to know. Mm -hmm. fish and the koi that you've just seen in the back. And a lot of our customers and so forth come in and take part of this because they want to do the feeding when they do their shopping. They get a shot, just give them a little bit. Whatever they can eat in about two to three minutes is what we recommend feeding the um, decorative fish. So are these the kind that were just over in the tank that Correct. we just looked at? Correct, absolutely. So like I said, they'll grow kind of to the size of your pond. If you have a small pond, which would be four by six, those will um, spread up to be about, fish will be about six inches long. If you have a larger pond, you'll see, like the big orange guy out there, you'll see almost a foot long, not a little bit, a little bit longer. But yeah, we have a lot of fun here. You'll see customers coming in, they'll just spend hours just sitting here feeding fish and just taking it all in. Yeah, that's what we like to do. We always like to just come up here and enjoy all the flowers and everything that's growing around this area because it's so pretty and just feed the fish. Right. Take pictures up here. It's nice to get away from everything, right? It sure is. And they used to have a horse over there by the barn too that we would right. visit. Right. You can come up here in the um, different seasons. They have different activities. Uh, we really like to come up in the fall. Uh, they get the tractor out and they pull the kids around and you can get uh, sausage sandwiches and french fries and ice cream and do a lot of really fun neat neat things some games for your for the little kiddos so this is such a great place to be uh this is just a couple miles from our house so we're lucky to have it so close to us Here's the sun setting in the cove. We get to enjoy these views every evening. This plant right here is my favorite. I'll make sure I take one to take home so I can show you guys tomorrow how you put it in the ground. Okay, and show you the different plant parts. This is a begonia, non-stop begonia. They like shade and I have a lot of shade around my house. So I'll show you how to plant this when we get to my house. Okay, so that was the inside of Spring Farm Greenhouses. We're the largest garden center in central Pennsylvania. We do a nursery, uh, perennials, bedding plants. We do a lot of landscaping and so forth for plants that are looking with new houses and a lot and everything. If you guys have any questions, we're out here in Martinsburg and you can contact us at 814-793-3954. Thank you. <laughs>
I want the roots to get a chance to take hold and go down into the ground and not be so stuck, you know, and tight together. So I'm just gonna go ahead and break that up a little bit. All right, so you can see we've got our roots. You can see those vitamins and nutrients, the fertilizer there in the soil. You can see the stems from this side, especially shooting up towards the sun with the leaves. That's the food making factory where the photosynthesis, the food making process takes place. We've got our flower with the petals. I love how those look on a begonia. They get really nice and full. Okay, so it's time to put this in the ground. So let's get that trowel shovel. Here we go. I'm gonna find a hole here. I actually already have spots on my flower bed each year where I know I'm going to put my flowers where I had a hole the year before. Sometimes it's just a lower place and I've got to feel them out where they're at. Like this is a good spot where one would be. So I'm just going to go ahead and get the dirt out of there and kind of estimate how deep I need to make it so that this will fit down inside, okay? You don't want your leaves and your stem to go too far under the ground. So let me see if this would be correct. I'm gonna just place it in there, see if that's about the right depth. I think I might have taken a little bit too much soil out, so I'm gonna put a little bit back in, okay, because I want my stem and my leaves to be up above the mulch. All right, I think that's perfect. Okay, so once you get it in the ground at the depth that you would like it at, you're going to go ahead then, here, let me get my, gloves on here and I'm going to put the soil back in the hole and we're going to pat it down in place so it stays firm in the ground. So let's get our shovel out of the way here and bring our dirt in okay, around our plant. All right guys, pat the soil there. I like to push down on the ground to make sure it's in there really well okay that way you know the wind can't affect it or an animal if it would walk by it and usually what i do is what kenton told us to do yesterday i'll put some carpet sweeper plants that are low to the ground in front of the begonias then i'll have my medium-sized plants like my husheras my astables and my begonias right in the middle and then my raspberry plants and my ferns that are a little bit bigger will be in the back they're the tallest all right I hope you enjoyed planting this plant with me. This is one of my favorite topics to teach you about. We'll see you next time, everybody.